learned in the first part of this program how the relationship between AI, data, and workflows shapes mission delivery. The journey begins and ends with data. To tell you more, Taka Ariga, former Chief Data Officer and Chief AI Officer at the Office of Personnel Management, and Patrick McGarry, Federal Chief Data Officer at ServiceNow. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for joining me, Taka. OPM, not the only place, of course, that you've been involved with data inside the federal government, either in organizations that you've been in or that you've observed from the outside. What have you seen be, be the primary obstacles to getting data ready for AI applications? Yeah, Francis, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I guess the number one issue that I've seen is conflating IT with AI, hmm. because there's so much wild well, technology overlap for sure, but when it comes to AI, the way that we treat data is differently. It's no longer rows and column. A lot of time it's really more vectorized store. Um, and we, sh we shouldn't uh, sort of treat software developer the same way that we treat AI engineer, data engineer, or even data scientists. There's a so much user experience element of this. So it's more than just infrastructure architectural consideration. And the last point I'll just make is that AI has its distinctive challenges. It's very difficult to say we're now going to subdivide IT organization into a bunch of part-timers to drive that solution development. Mm -hmm. What has what have you seen to help people get over the idea that AI and IT are kind of the same thing or should be treated in the same way? Yeah, um, I go back to my experience at GAO. We had an innovation lab and our focus was really specifically to develop these AI use cases because there were a lot of new challenges that we needed to address. How do we scale these things? How do we bring unstructured data together in a way that is sort of ingestible? How do we develop the context to these queries? And how do we develop the user experience that are necessary to develop the trust that the auditor needs to have. And those are not the kind of thing that you can typically go from left to right in a software lifecycle development. And so, you know, we very much focus on developing those prototypes, and then we partner with the IT organization to think through the scalability and productionalization concerns. Patrick, welcome. Uh, what, how does what you've seen as you've worked with agencies all across government sync with what Taka just described? Well, I think he's right on, uh, but I, I would take it a step further in terms of the, the sort of AI IT divide. I think the biggest thing that we're looking at right now is uh, almost cultural, right? I like to describe it as a socio-technical problem, right? You got to bring the people and the technology into this particular solution. And, you know, when you look at the biggest problem, it's really data fragmentation. Right, because you've got all these people that have got their stovepipes and they want to keep their data for themselves and they don't talk to each other and they don't work together. And so the data has the same sorts of problems where it's just not interoperable. So I think everybody in government and, and everywhere really knows that, hey, we got a lot of data, mm -hmm. you know, and the problem is they can't tie that data to specific mission problems or data stewards or even to each other, uh, in, you know, other data sets. And so I think the first problem we're really going to have to solve is a cultural problem mm. of how do we really work together and then the data can do the same thing. So the cultural issue, obviously then that's not a process or technology problem, that's a people problem. That there. is absolutely a people problem. What have you seen as a way, to, is that building a strategy and conveying that strategy to the people that are involved? Is that tactical operations or uh, tactical things that people do? What's What's the, the root of that? Yeah, I've seen a number of different approaches to how people solve this, but you know, really I think the most effective ways is really when you start cutting across the organization, right? You bring all of the stakeholders together in some way that doesn't feel stilted, right? You gotta get the legal folks and the IT folks and the data folks and the, you know, the reporting folks uh, working together in some way. Uh, and I think that has to be unique to your organization because otherwise it's going to feel like it's something that was bolted onto the side of the org. You were nodding enthusiastically as he was talking about all the partners yep. that will be involved in that conversation. Did he yeah. get them all or are there others that you think should be at the table too? Absolutely. I mean, at OPM, we pilot this process called agile governance. It's bringing all the different stakeholders, the legal privacy, human capital procurement to the table. But that specifically, we structure that governance to move at the speed of innovation so that we're not having technology moving ahead mm -hmm. while all these potentially bureaucratic items are playing catch up. And so I think that was an important realization for us that 
you know, ex innovation can actually be accelerated when you have agile governance in mm -hmm. place. How did you build that agility into the governance structure? Because when I think of those two things, one's over here and one's over yeah. here. We took a, um, euphemistically, a two pizza rule. Uh -huh. uh, so we limited the participation to no more than 10 people, but it was a cross-sectional set of folks uh, from HR, privacy, legal, data, uh, technology shop for sure. We met actually very frequently on a bi-weekly basis and we went through all of the issues. Because the traditional governance structure, maybe you meet once a quarter, mm -hmm. right, for an hour across agency, and you make it that five minute on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And there's no way we can address the plethora of issue that we need to make these timely decisions on. Mm -hmm. So we met every week, uh, every, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, every other week, mm -hmm. and we address all of not only the use case issues, but all of the risk inherent to those use case issues, and we make these incremental decisions along the way. Blessed it's humans talking to each other about how things are working and whether they should be changed, Patrick, is what it sounds like. Yeah. What a concept. I, right. Yeah. And I mean, if the humans aren't talking, there's no amount of machines talking that's going to solve the problem. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so we talked at the beginning of this. I plugged that we would discuss on this program the concept of getting control of one's data. What's the definition of that in 2025 when AI applications are proliferating across government and the data you said a few moments ago? It's plenty of data. Everybody's got data. Uh, what does data control look like now? I think the the biggest thing is not being fo too focused on the data right i think really you know the data is a tool like anything else and ultimately you've got to understand what are the problems we're trying to solve right so you've got to take the data that you have contextualize it right so you bring together data from different parts of the organization but make sure that you're always driving towards that mission outcome mm -hmm. right and i think that's that's going to be the real key in terms of control your data because a lot of the rest of it is going to fall out as a matter of course when you're trying to answer real problems. The other part of it is really about governance. Uh, too often, governance is hosted in some kind of PDF on a SharePoint you know, site somewhere, uh, and, and no one ever looks at it. Right? So making sure that your governance is tied with the data and moves with it. Uh, that way, your organization can sort of move at that mission speed uh, without having to worry about governance falling down along the way. Now, when you say don't focus on the data so much, that sounds counterintuitive to me. Is that because people kind of get decision paralysis by thinking so much about the data and how it has to be shaped and how it has to be curated and how perfect it has to be that they never actually get around to doing the things with it that they that will help them on mission delivery? Yeah, absolutely. I call that analysis paralysis. Yeah. And I'm not the first one to use that term, right? So it's if you get too wrapped around the axle on your data, um, you're going to forget what questions you're answering. I want to go back to the the analytic or the governance piece that you talked about a moment ago because of something Patrick said. He talked about governance being in a PDF hung someplace where nobody ever looks at it, and that strikes me that that every two week cadence that yeah. you established at OPM prevented that exact thing that it didn't have a chance to get stuck at the back at the back of some hard drive somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. From a policy perspective, we knew AI is in such a sort of moving state. The policies themselves were meant to be evolving because we didn't have all of the answers. But we also coupled policy with continuous monitoring just to be able to understand how our user actually engaging with whether it's permissible AI solution or worst case scenario, impermissible AI solution. So you know, it's really setting up that structure to make sure not only the policy, the governance, the risk management can all evolve as circumstances change. So you had a little bit of an advantage on this next question because of your GAO experience, but when you were at OPM, where did you go both inside government and outside government to see how they were doing it to see how that might apply to how you wanted to do it at OPM. Yeah, when I was at GAO, we learned the lesson early on that we shouldn't treat data in the context of buckets. We should be treating data in the context of fabrics. Like these threads are interconnected. And fundamentally, if folks think that the way that AI works is simply by shoving data into these AI models and they will magically function, I think they are in for rude awakening. There are a lot of contextual training. There are a lot of, of what we call retrieval augmented generation techniques that needs to apply, especially for an agency like GAO, like OPM, where our AI vision 
doesn't necessarily rest with chat GPT perplexity or, or claw. It rests with a lot of these bespoke solutions that we end up developing in-house because we need it for evaluation purposes, we need it for you know human uh, hiring decision experience kind of purposes. So thinking about how reliant we are on proprietary governmental data, how do we protect that? How do we ensure the reliability of that? And how do we build the data pipeline in a way that allows those interactions to be as relevant and as accurately as possible? Are there places outside the federal government, Patrick, that you point people to in the government or maybe uh, it, within the government, but different parts that you point folks to, to say they're doing something similar to or the same as what you're doing and you may be able to learn from them? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there are tons of people that have uh, shining moments, mm -hmm. right? And I think uh, there, there are definitely a few where I'll, you know, I'll point them to, uh, one was actually uh, one of the largest advertising agencies in the world, uh, where they had, you know, myriad agencies underneath them, and they wanted to build this network of, you know, all marketable adults in North America, for instance. And being able to take that scale or that scope of data uh, and really apply complex questions to it, like, I think that's where it starts to get interesting, uh, you know, and the same thing on the governmental side, right, where you've got uh, some very interesting approaches, sometimes because of resource constraints, right? And, and I think that the environment that people are working in often create these very unique, you know, the, the champagne moments uh, that you get, right? And I, so I think it's really important to sort of look across the breadth, you know, you know look under your, your neighbor's test paper, right? To see what can I steal from around me? Uh, and the more that we sort of beg, borrow, and steal from each other, I think the more we're gonna sort of aggregate those shining moments. The timing uh, of this program is interesting based on one thing that you just said, people are all across the federal government are thinking about resources right now. Yeah. What, what drives what you just described that sometimes limited resources makes people think harder think more innovatively or whatever. How do you realize the maximum potential of, of that situation, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I think you've just uh, highlighted a very large uh, sort of pressure cooker uh, that is creating a lot of uh, impetus to find efficiencies, right? However you feel about the, the sort of reduction in force in the federal government, it's forcing those agencies that are now being asked to produce the same amount of results with fewer re resources mm -hmm. to get a lot smarter about how they spend those resources and, and where the answers come from. And so AI is actually well-timed for this because that's one of the things that it does really well mm -hmm. is it can take informed, educated people that understand the technology and multiply their impact. Mike talked in the first part of this program, Taka, about the agencies that uh, decide AI is a cool thing to do or useful tool and they pursue AI. I know from conversations you and I have had both in OPM and at GAO, you thought about it differently and looked for use cases, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program. How did you analyze issues that needed help at OPM and decide either we should apply uh, an AI solution here, or this isn't an AI thing and we should go in a different direction. Yeah, one of my personal pet peeves is we often talk about AI like that movie Lord of the Ring. There's a one flavors of AI that governs them all. But in reality, the way I think about it, there's five common archetypes. You have your chat GPTs of the world, while great, but it's a very difficult use case for governmental agency to deal with, especially with proprietary non-public information. And then you have these, uh, almost like a productivity augmentation like Microsoft Office, you know, Excel, PowerPoint, things like that. These two categories are general purpose AI. They don't really understand the context of your organization. They will transcribe your meetings for you. They will even sort of do your Excel functions for you, but fundamentally they don't know the difference between OPM and GAO. The vast majority of our attention were focused on these bespoke in-house developed solution to serve a very specific mission objective. And then the fourth one are these AI product that we end up buying, uh, you know, whether it's Adobe, whether it's Canva, whether it's some other sort of tool to specifically focus on those function. But the last category is actually the one that kept me up at night, is all these surprise AI that show up. We didn't ask for them, uh -huh. but when I turn on the laptop, suddenly shining flashlight to say, try this AI feature. Mm -hmm. And of course, then we have to now spin up retrospectively all the risk management, contra contractual procurement risks, you know, related conversation. So when you start unpacking AI into those different archetypes, I find we having much more nuanced discussions around risk, value, and costs. 
Patrick. We just have a minute or so left, but your eyes lit up when he talked about risk. Absolutely. Well, it's not necessarily risk, but I, I really wanted to underscore sort of the understanding that there's different kinds of AI and people that try to lump it all into one package is tough because, you know, when, when you look at it, the the sort of generalized AI that people are that know from ChatGPT, when they take that thing that is the appearance of intelligence and they stuff it into a very, very specific use case, you've taken something that is, you know, quote unquote smart and you've made it dumb. Right. And so I think you really need to understand the tool that you're working with. You know, don't try to hammer a nail with a wrench. I'm really good at that. If you ask my wife, she will testify to my ability to do exactly that. Patrick Taka, thanks very much for joining me.